Um, tell me a little bit, what's your creative talent? Okay. Um, well, actually, I, I do love drawing. Um, I do love acting, uh, puppetry. So um, I think this has always been a, a part of a huge part of my life as a teacher, actually. Um, because not only do I enjoy it as a, a, an art form in itself, but I also enjoy to bring it into the classroom uh, and use it with students. Um, I always find that whenever you can uh, uh, bring some form, form of art into the classroom, or artistic expression, um, it takes language learning to a whole new level. Um, because it, 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 you're dealing directly with emotions the effective side of things so um, you know you have strong feelings about something either strong feelings about you know something someone's painted or an image you've seen um, and that's enough to get language going so um, it very much coincides with my belief in, 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 in the about what happens in the classroom um, that uh, sometimes um, learning emerges from opportunities which emerge in the classroom um, and the students reactions and you grab hold of that and you, you work with them so I think any form of artistic expression always helps that type of um, contribution someone will always have something to say um, even if they say you know I hate this I, I think this is disgusting this isn't art um, especially if you if you bring in examples of um, modern art contemporary art people think you know well this isn't art you know because we're stuck with an idea of um, sort of what art should be you know the classical paintings and so on so um, it, it's good in itself because it, it, it brings responses and, and I like to you know have a go at artistic creation sometimes not brilliant at it but um, it, it is good because you try it out and you learn it's as if you're learning a new language and I think that's why it's important for me as a language teacher uh, it also forces my own um, my own awareness of what teaching is about so that's why I think I like it um, being able to converse in another language which isn't my own sort of native language as it were so I think if that's sort of that's probably it in okay. terms of and how that's good for the teachers and bringing to the classroom you're in a different position now in your career yeah. how do you bring it to your work yeah um, Okay, so I think what it brings to me is um, something I've been doing a lot with teachers as we work on teacher training and teacher development. Um, I am very conscious of the fact that um, in a classroom, at any given moment, we're occupying spaces. Um, and I often think that we're not fully aware of the spaces we occupy. Um, and this comes a lot from um, observing teachers um, when you observe teachers teaching you're in a privileged position uh, to see things from another perspective which you can't do when you're teaching yourself and so you know how you move in the classroom the spaces that you occupy spaces of um, teaching as it were you know which is classically at the front of the classroom um, can we play around with this if we change this can we create other forms of communication and collaboration in the classroom? Um, and that all comes out from just looking at uh, where you are, if you're standing, if you're sitting, if you're working in groups with students, how you're moving in the classroom. So I've been working a lot with teachers and observing the teaching space. And that might mean sometimes I just take a snapshot of what was happening in the classroom. Um, and I show it to teachers with mobiles nowadays, it's very easy. Um, you know, so that they become aware of, of something which teachers sometimes do and they're not even aware of, so that they pin themselves to the front of the classroom. And that changes the dynamic. So I've been using images like that. So that's one of the levels I've been aware of the image um, of, um, and, and, in the classroom and, and how we can use it. But I think there are other things as well um, that also 
interests me and it comes more from the side of um, visual arts performance arts this sort of barrier which is so you know thin between one and the other um, and performance art always brings this and um, installation art and immersion art I think um, it puts you all of a sudden in another context and you have to see again it's always from seeing things from other perspectives um, and you become deeply involved in something which involves either a scenario a lot of artists are using architectural forms nowadays to 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 ex to allow um, uh, people to experience architecture from another perspective from the perspective of you know what it's like to be inside that building um, and many artists as well performance artists are doing this you know within closed spaces like galleries and so um, this comes back to something I've been talking a lot to teachers about from a teacher training and teacher development perspective you know what is it that we do in the classroom because um, the model in which you know you're just there at the front handing out and knowledge as it were and, and not working alongside students I, I don't think it's sustainable anymore um, and I think students don't um, want that anymore as well um, so it means we have to look at other areas I think to understand where we can go with our teaching and what we can do um, we do this a lot with young learners you know we're very much aware of this um, so we will take young learners out of the classroom we'll take them on field trips we will work with them in the garden we will use objects to aid the learning process and the objects become part of the learning process which is very much the same philosophy you have be behind using puppets and puppetry so um, but we assume that as young children grow um, we don't need this concrete experience anymore so we sort of leave that to the side and I rather think it's not quite like that you know um, I think we can use the space in the classroom in a much more um, exciting manner and um, uh, the idea of using objects is, is wonderful you know because objects have different meanings so you know, an object which I bring into the classroom may mean something to me but to another student it, they will interpret the object in another way so this immediately brings about you know something which is quite interesting which is classic in the communicative language teaching which is the information gap um, we can do this in other ways but um, using other forms of expression which isn't just tied down to how we use books and, and, and that we cover curriculum and the syllabus and all of that that we have to test them so um, I know there's this sort of raw side to life and reality and teaching that there's testing and assessment and going through stages, I know that. But I think learning can be much more exciting and, and much more um, engaging um, if we do try and bring in other elements into the classroom. So mm -hmm. even as a teacher trainer, I've sometimes been preferring to allow teachers to experience with immersive situations rather than say, you know this is the theory this is how we do it let's have a look I've, I've been taking teachers through experiences and I think I've enjoyed that much more and I think it's been much more rewarding so that is how it's affected my other side of work you know great and you talked about bringing things to the classroom what type of technology have you been using in the classroom okay so um well this is much more in terms of what I've been experimenting with and I haven't been doing it by myself I've been doing it with colleagues uh, and one of the people I've been working a lot recently together with is Giselle Santos and some of you may know her um, so we've been experimenting with um, different um, um, technologies in the classroom including virtual reality um, and we've also been playing around with ideas of um, of doing things a sort of a, a maker situation um, in the classroom um, I'm also currently working on with um, colleagues as well um, the, the ideas of um, doing other things making puppets 
cooking and sort of other experimentation, not just technology. But technology, definitely. We've been um, experimenting a little bit with virtual reality, augmented reality as well. Um, I can't quite tell you where that's going to take us yet. Um, it's much more experimentation phase. Um, I can see tons of possibilities because you mix um, you mix the technology with the sensation of the real. And this is the interesting thing about virtual reality. So we tried this out a couple of um, weeks ago and um, we took the children sort of on a journey. And um, the first thing we noticed with young learners was that um, they immediately, and, and this probably has a lot to do with young learners, the young learners shift quite quickly from reality to an imaginary world much more than as we grow up we lose this ability. So the moment they put the VR goggles on they were literally immersed in the new environment and it was like you didn't have to say anything but immediately they were you know trying to grab things with their hands even though they were standing they knew they were in a environment a closed environment but they tried to grab things uh, uh, and you know squeals of excitement and enjoyment and the sense it became very real for them. And that was something that surprised me. I, I, I hadn't expected that. And it was really, you know, it was very dynamic and different. So that made us think, you know, wow, this can be really interesting. Um, what we try and do, you know, sometimes, which we take so long to create a context, set the scene, it just like, happened in seconds so I thought that was pretty amazing you know and with older adults we saw the same thing happening which is really interesting um, just made me think about the teenagers you know where we, we assume teenagers you know would love technology but they were so like oh yes I've done this before I've seen this before it didn't have the same impact as it did with young learners and adults so I thought that was very interesting so we've been playing around with that experimenting with it um, but I can't say exactly where we're going to go with it just yet. Um, but I see huge potential there, and um, it, it can be quite exciting, I think. All right. And, and what are the differences that you've seen over the years with the use of images in the classroom? Um, well, I'm going to say something which is, I think, very sad. <laughs> I don't know if I've seen so much difference. Um, I, I trained as a primary school teacher and um, when you train as a primary school teacher, I mean that is something you do a lot. You bring images into the class when you work with images and that's probably why it's so strong with me. So I've always tried to bring it into the classroom. I've always encouraged colleagues to do it and I've seen that happening. Um, I think the big difference has been with technology, we see, you know, huge shifts. So if beforehand we were stuck with not very clear images which we showed on an overhead projector, because I go back, way back to the overhead projector, times of the overhead projector. So that was very difficult, or slides, which was even deadlier in a way. Um, Obviously now we have the, the, the possibility of showing very, very clear cut images and with, uh, you know, good strong quality so I mean that makes a difference and with the internet you know we have there is no limit anymore which we used to be limited to to having access to images so something we used to do a lot was bring in magazines and so on um, and we don't need to do that so it's much easier but on the other side the, on the other hand and, and this is where I, I said you know I don't know if it's changed that much what I have seen also is that and and, and I think this is our field, you know, we've been stuck with this thing of reaching goals and testing and assessment and standardization and the syllabus and, um, and following the book and parents asking us to do that as well. Um, so, I mean, I can't say teachers are to blame for this. I, I see it as a, you know, it's something which has happened to society. Um, so in a way that has sort of stopped us from sometimes being as creative as we would like to be because I think teachers are naturally creative. I think actually you're lured into teaching because you are a creative soul. 
Um, but you know, there have been things which have stopped us from engaging as far as we might w wish to engage. So I see this other side, and. In a way, technology helps us because it can help us redress this balance. But on the other hand, you know, there are other demands on teachers nowadays, which, you know, weren't so strong, I don't think, you know, like a couple of years ago. But the industry of testing, literally, you know, has sort of, you know, put on a weight on us, which I, I, I don't know, I understand it. Uh, I don't agree with it though, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that's why I say, you know, perhaps we haven't gone as far as we could. Mm -hmm. I think that's my take on it. Right. And you kind of touched on it a little bit um, about do most teachers actually use enough imaging, but to take it a step further, do you think they're using it properly? Well, I've seen some teachers doing wonderful things with, with images. Um, I wonder what we mean by using it properly. That's an interesting question. Because um, I, I always think that whenever we, we plan a lesson, we, we, we plan it, and we generally plan lessons. Uh, we know where we're going with things. And um, sometimes le learners surprise us, and I, it's what I call an ambush attack by learners. You know, we, we were hoped to go in one direction, we're ambushed by them, and suddenly we're forced to go in a completely different direction. It's not where we wanted, and that's where the lack of comfort comes in and frustration almost. But um, so you might imagine you would use it in one way. So often, I, you know, teachers plan, oh, if I'll bring this in and then we can use this to write a poem or, or to express ourselves and the kids don't go there. Um, but it, I don't think it's because of the image. I think it's because of other reasons. Um, so, um, so the idea was good. It probably didn't get there because the students had another agenda that day. You know, probably if you tried it another day, they would have, you know, enjoyed it. But um, that day it didn't work. Um, so, so I think you know that's an issue. Um, students surprise us sometimes. Um, on the other hand, you know, um, exactly. You know, I think there's so much we can use the image as an end in itself, or we can use the image as a vehicle. Um, with with young learners, sometimes the image is a, a byproduct of expression. So. We do this a lot, you know, we get them to paint something, to colour something in, or to make a collage. And obviously with young learners you won't have much. There is a limit of linguistic expression you can expect from them. And that is enough, isn't it? But as they grow older and develop um, linguistically, we expect so much more <laughs> from them. So I wonder if the image, you know, even if we're talking about, if we think about um, films, you know, it's something we can uh, get students to produce. Um, but what, what type of language are we talking about, okay? Um, we often feel, I think, we're under the pressure of, because it's a language classroom, that language has to pr be produced in that lesson. So we tend to say, no, if it's a film, it has to have dialogue, it has to have spoken English. Well, does it really? Um, I wonder, I wonder if students can't produce something which actually is just a sequence of images but which will afterwards generate a lot of debate and discussion. It doesn't have to be in the lesson itself. So it means we're no longer stuck with that pressure, and especially in our context here in Brazil, where it's monolingual. Uh, the pressure of, you know, you've got to speak English in the classroom all the time, it means that we can't use, we can't produce things which the students will naturally start speaking Portuguese. And is it such a sin? that they do to produce something because afterwards we're going to have something they've created we can generate so much more and it can be so interesting and motivating um, I think it's actually just thinking you know what exactly is a lesson what does it entail and what I expect from it and, and what we can do with what students have produced and I think that would um, change things completely so Coming back again to the question, is it, you know, do they do it properly? I, I think we have to really question what is properly and proper and, and what we expect from students. And perhaps we can think a bit more widely. I think that would be probably my answer. Very good. 
And what improvements would you like to see in the overall curriculum? Not from the teacher's point of view, but from the administrators and the educators' point for visual arts. I think it has to be taken a bit more seriously as a form of expression. Um, what we see today in society is that everything is actually based on your ability to appreciate information visually. Okay, um, And that's the way media works nowadays. Um, everything, young children, they are so caught up in this already. Um, you know, they are very quick to notice images, to work with them, to understand them, um, and understand the power of, of the image. And we see materials being designed which already bring, brings this in, much more than we used to in the past. But the thing is, whenever you're working with this, it, 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 it's not so linear. So I, I see a strong necessity to open up the syllabus and the curriculum. Rather than define things much more, I, I would very much feel happier if we opened things up a bit more. Um, I rather suspect people are thinking about this because, uh, you know, we, we hear of, you know, organizations and testing um, institutions which are working perhaps with wider frameworks um, so we can see a lot of focus on the four C's and this is you know within the last two years it's hit the world of ELT you know we can't go back on that one although I'm not quite sure we've grasped exactly how that will work yet um, so I think we will see a movement along those lines I think it is coming into our field much more strongly. So I think the syllabus will have to look at itself, or people will have to look at the syllabus and think, you know, what are we doing here? Where are we taking these children? What do we want, would they expect them? What are we preparing them for? What type of um, communication and abilities will they need uh, beyond the language classroom? Okay, and just for one more, in one minute, give me your best tip that you can give to educators using images. Okay, so um, select carefully the image you want to work with. Um, I do think you've got to be very passionate about that image. Um, think how you're going to work with it, but accept students' options of how they deal with it. Um, the way you interpret something might not be the way they interpret it, and it doesn't mean it's you know less worthwhile. It just it's just gone in another direction, and um, whatever they give you, if it's interesting enough, and if it um, generates a lot of reaction and action, then that's good. I think that's um, the image has served its purpose, and I think the, uh, the teaching and the learning has happened. If, um, never heard about the visual arts circle i suggest you google visual arts circle the site find out what it's about what our objectives are um, what we hope to achieve in the language classroom um, by using the visual arts um, there are many articles you might find very interesting and um, so do check it out and join us whenever and you can thanks so much for being here today with a beautiful day in the park and sharing your ideas with us. Thank you very much um, and lovely to have been interviewed.